Hello YouTube, it's Doss Gregor, and welcome to another Gen 2 in review. It looks like a lot of you have been enjoying some of the Gen 2 information videos I've been doing lately. I apologize that I haven't had any type of a distribution review lately. Work has been very busy, and I have had a lot of things going on. However, the shorter uh, Gen 2 videos have been a little helpful, and so hopefully they're helpful to you as well. I've got a couple ideas of things to go through, and a few other ideas that I need to test first. But today, we're going to be looking at something that I've been getting a lot of requests for, and that is to look at my make.com file, which I think I've gone over a few times in other videos when discussing building Gen 2 and some other aspects of Gen 2. But this one's going to be just a quick, simple, this is what it looks like, this is what it means, and this is what it's going to do sort of thing. Now, I warn you, it's not going to be anything fancy. It's it's just plain and, and, and unobtrusive. So without further ado, I'd like to remind you that Gen 2 has moved where the make.com file is. It used to be in the etc folder but now we find it in the slash etc portage make dot com area we'll open that up and first off the first three flags pretty much are generic that I have never messed with the C flags equals a negative O2 dash pipe, the CXX flags equaling dollar sign C flags, the C host equaling the type of machine that I am running off of. Those pretty much get laid down in the default make.conf file that comes when you go to install Gen2 for the first time. Where things start to change just a little bit is when you get to this fourth option. The make ops equals minus J9. Now what this option does is, and, and it's a rule of thumb that I have found, that the number of processors in your computer plus one should be what make ops dash J should be equal to. In my case, I've got a quad core processor with uh, eight processors that it recognizes. So I say a negative J9. Now, if you had a dual core, you'd probably have four, etc. And if, of course, there's a single core, you just add the one. But you'd always add one to it. I keep the next line, the use line. Now, these are global use options. Now, I would like to say that SSE2, SSE, MMX, Bendist, and are, are those those four right there their default now I have added because I have found with this particular system that for sound to work correctly I really need pulse audio to work proper so I have added pulse audio right here as a global use flag I use Python for a lot of items so I have added Python and I have added ICU. Now you might be saying why ICU because that can cause some trouble with some applications. Well it can also cause you some issues if you are a Chromium user and you didn't build your system with ICU support from the ground up. In fact to use Chromium one of the first steps in my Chromium install guide talks about having to make sure you put ICU in there and rebuild doing an emerge deep reinstall and new use option to go back and rebuild all the applications with ICU so that Chromium will work properly. What I have found in the past when I first started using Gen2 I should say with my use flags I used to have use flags that would go two and three, four lines going across, and I would have 20 to anywhere from 20 to 40 or 50 of them actually in here. And I have found that in the last couple years, 
it is a much better process to put your use flags in the package.use and give them specific to the applications that require them. Keep your make.conf file as simple as possible. You don't want your make.conf file to have so much in it that it really bogs you down and confuses you. If all of a sudden you're having build errors, for instance, because there are things not working properly, most likely if it looks like it's a conflict, it's because you have too much in your global use flag and a specific use flag is causing different packages to not build correctly because they can't have this, the type of uses that you have. If you put two use flags, for instance, that conflict each other with an application as a global option when you only need one or the other, I have had in the past applications that have come back to me and said, error, uh, you have specified both of these use flags, yet only one of these can be used. Please pick one and set it properly in your package.use file. So I found because of things like that, it is much better to manage use flags with the package.use file than it is to do it within here. You want to be as frugal as possible, I have found, with your make.conf with the use option. The next line as we go on is Gen2 mirrors. Now, I use the mirror application, mirror select, that you can install when building, and I tell it to kind of go through and start downloading some test sections from each mirror, and it tries to find the fastest, most reliable ones for you to use, for it to download packages from. I have found specifically the gen2.osuosl.org to be very reliable, and some of these others as well as uh, being good for me. But that's going to be different for wherever you are in the world and wherever your network is. You may find by using mirrors select that your mirrors that come back here are completely different than my mirrors. It kind of reminds me of the Chinese distribution that I did a couple months ago that immediately upon doing an update with it, it was slow. It was like dial-up speeds downloading these things and I found that, oh, you need to change your mirror selection for something closer and faster. Once I did that, no problems. The same issue here. If you do not have this, this is an optional uh, command line right here, Gen2 mirrors. It is optional because if you don't have it, it will just default to what it can find and that sometimes will work just fine for you. This next one, of course, is an optional build uh, action right here, command. Emerge underscore default underscore ops equals dash dash auto unmatched dash right. Now be careful if you decide to use this. This is why you should always use the dash A when doing an emerge to ask you about everything. What this dash dash auto unmasked dash right does is if there are programs that have new use requirements or for instance you are installing something that is not quite stable that may require an extra keyword to install it will come back and say these things here need to be written to your package keywords file, your package use file, etc. Do you want to do this at this time? And you can say, yes, I agreed all those things. Go ahead and write them. And once you do that, you can do an ETC update and then make those changes permanent. Or you can say, no, 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 I don't want, I didn't realize it was going to do all that stuff. No, stop that, you know. But if you don't use the dash A, it will automatically write those changes. Now, it won't put them into effect, of course, until you use ETC update to, to finalize them. But it still attempts to write them. And the next time you do an update, it will want to put them in there if you're not paying attention. But it is a, it is a time saver to use that command instead of just doing you know, the standard emerge and then having it error out and say, oh, you need to change these files and you need to change them 
manually or use the auto unmask right to have it change it for you. In the next one, the accept license. I tend to accept license, of course, of the asterisk meaning everything and at EULA. And the reason I do this, and I know that there are some end user license agreements out there that you probably really need to pay attention to, but I know that 99.9% .9 of everything I do is going to be legit, isn't going to have a license agreement that I disagree with, and so I just don't want it to come back and stop me or hinder me from continuing on, especially if halfway through the night I'm doing some updates and it pops up and says, oh, before you continue, you have to accept this license agreement. So I just have it accept licenses and there you go. Now, these next couple lines are important for Xorg and when you're setting up a GUI, and I've discussed this in my KDE install, the video cards for me, for instance, in this machine, uses Intel. And then as a backup, I use the FB dev driver, just in case, for some reason, Intel fails. So that's my backup. That is why for video cards, I have two options instead of just the one. Now, if you were a novu or, or no user or, or using NVIDIA and wanting to use the, the open source drivers Novu, you would have Novu in there. You'd have ATI in there. You know, depending upon what your video card is, you'd have to do research, of course, to make sure you have the right cards in there. As for input devices, I'm not sure if we still need keyboard and mouse in there, but that is kind of a throwback to when I'm just used to putting everything that I was in, that was important that it build. And when you put in the input devices like keyboard, EV Dev, Synaptics for a touchpad, and mouse. It's going to install the proper drivers needed for XORG based upon these selections. The same with right here with the video card support. So that's what these two here are for. We move on to source, varlib layman make.conf. Now this is important if you've installed layman. And I do have a video about layman and adding in extra repositories and that's what this is for. This tells it what make file to use for layman. Now, another thing that I have played around with is this Portage bin host. You can use with Emerge ability to create a bin package for applications that you have compiled and installed on your system. You can put those packages into a directory, set up the Portage bin host, and when you do an emerge, if you haven't done any changes to your system and you just need to reinstall that package, you can actually point it to where you put those packages, in my case somewhere on a server, and I have that all set up so that that does that, and then it will install the bin package that you have created from the source that you've done very handy to have if you have to reinstall some files just because uh, they, they may need to be relinked or something. Porter, Dister, and Packager are all programs I do believe that came default also kinda like these up here and I do not believe I have changed anything. The Portage directory of course, user Portage, the distribution directory being the portage directory with the dist files, which is where all your files are stored, where it finds it. And of course, the packages directory. That's all dealing with the portage tree. Nothing you should ever have to change. So in recap, if we think about it, the only thing that we really have to worry about is if you're creating bin directories and you want to put your file somewhere, because what good is it, for instance, to put or create bin files and keep them locally on your computer because if you reimage your computer or have to reinstall the computer you're, you're going to wipe those out when you do a format to start over so you need to make sure that you're putting those on a server or a NAS drive somewhere else outside of there the source directory of course if you're using layman and outside repositories the input and video options for when you're setting up xorg your license exception, 
your Emerge Default Options, if you so choose, your Mirrors, and your Customized Use Flags, and how many processors to use when compiling. Now this does make a big difference, people. If you left that as dash J1, for instance, to say only use one processor, it would probably take seven or eight times longer to compile code. And in some cases, when it already takes hours to compile one package, that can change it to days. I remember back in the day when I used to install OpenOffice, and on my older laptop, if when OpenOffice would start to install, it would take 10 to 14 hours, depending, just to install OpenOffice. Now on my Core i7, with eight processors available and setting up nine to make it go a little faster, it does LibreOffice, which is what we're now using instead of OpenOffice, no more than two to two and a half hours, although that is still a long time to compile it is much better than 10 to 14 hours and that is why a lot of those types of packages if I know that they're coming along they're going to compile I do it right before bedtime and worry about it in the morning <laughs> so I hope this wasn't too dry I hope it explains my make.conf if you have any questions about what I've put in here or why I don't have other flags or, or user options feel free to ask me and I will try to explain why I've either left them out or just don't use them I have learned over the years because I've been using Gen 2 for many years it's been oh, a good 10 to 12 years that I've been working with Gen 2 I don't claim to be an expert but I do like to share my knowledge because I remember this was one of the hardest distributions for me to really get to know and I'll tell you once I got into it once my mind clicked on how everything runs I can't use anything else I, I just this is the distribution it is the best I've ever had to deal with it is wonderful to work with for me I don't mind the compile times although sometimes I do wish that Oh man, I want to do this and it's going to take me probably who knows how long for it to update its system or or I want to install this package and it's going to compile 130 packages just to get that to run. Oh well, sometimes you have to deal with that, but you know, it's still one of the most stable versions of Linux I've ever had to deal with if you take the time to learn it. And like I said, it's very difficult. So I hope my little videos do help somebody out there maybe explain a few things and kind of push them in the right direction I apologize for those who have reached out to me for assistance and I've tried to give them a little bit of knowledge here and there and and I'm, I apologize if I just haven't been able to fix your exact problem I am terrible at trying to I mean I can come up with things that I've dealt with in the past but I have a, a an issue that when I am Learning IT stuff, I, I kind of learn what I need to know and push out what I don't need to know until I need to need to know it again and then I have to refresh myself about it. So while I may have become an expert on, say, installing uh, program XYZ a year ago, I'm not going to remember much of it if I haven't messed with it in a year. <laughs> so anyway, I hope this helps. Thank you all for watching. If it's morning, evening, noon, or night, whatever you're having, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for the support and everything else that you've given. Enjoy, and we'll talk to you later. Bye, guys.